Hi there. My name is Donna Arnold. I'm a longtime art teacher, longtime watercolorist, and I thought today I'd share with you a pretty simple watercolor technique that never fails to bring really nice results. If you're a beginner or thinking about trying watercolor, this would be a great activity for you. If you've been around the block a few times, maybe you'll find this just for fun. Um, it's been a long, cold winter, so we're going to be painting flowers today just to remind us that spring will come. The materials you need are very simple. Um, we're going to be using a, a simple sketchbook to do a little drawing and then watercolor paper that I've got taped to a board, pencil and eraser, a couple simple paint brushes, and a Sharpie. Oh, I forgot my palette of paints. Those are pretty important too, but that's it. So to get started, I want to talk, I'll show you a couple examples first of where we're going. These are both demos I've done for other classes using the very same technique. Um, you can see it's a, a very loose impressionistic way to paint. We're not trying to actually duplicate the flowers. And this was a demo I did, was doing for another group, not a finished piece, but it gives you an idea of the processes and what we'll be doing. First, before we actually start on a painting, I'm going to give you a little, little bit of guidance on how we're going to draw. Usually when I'm starting people in painting, if the word draw comes up, it's like deer looking into the headlights. It's like, oh, I can't draw. Well, using this technique, yes, you can. This is something that I read about first in a wonderful book by Betty Edwards called Drawing on the Right Side of the Brain. It's been around for a long time and it's a very valid piece of, of, of work. I used it in all my years of high school teaching and didn't find anything to top it. So we're going to start with something called contour drawing, blind contour drawing. And if you think about what contour means, we're talking about edges, edges of things. So first I'm going to demonstrate for you what blind contour drawing looks like. Now don't expect this to be like a realistic image. I've got a thumb attached that's really handy to use as a model. When I'm doing blind contour drawing, my eyes are going to be tracking the edges that I see in my thumb. Um, which includes all the lines and the wrinkles and the lumps. So the rules for this game is I can't look at my drawing. Nope, it's blind. My eyes are going to track what I see slowly. What's going to happen then is you're going to be able to perceive things you don't really think about normally. So let me show you how this works. So I'm staring at my thumb and I can't talk to you while I do this because it'll throw my brain off and what I can perceive, honestly. Okay, so here I go. I'm starting. Let's see what I ended up with. Well, you can tell it's a thumb, and that's the whole idea. Those are probably the most honest marks you'll ever make if you draw in this way. But we're not going to stick with this to, to work into our painting, but we're going to do a, ver a modified version of it. In fact, that's the key word. We're going to do modified contour drawing, and this is what I'm going to have you learn to do. So we'll go back to my thumb again. This difference is I can look down maybe 20% at my paper. I still want to spend 80% of my time focusing on what I'm seeing, those edges. If you start to look down at your paper too much, you get all worried about what's right and what's wrong, and we lose that wonderful loose quality that we're after to put in our painting of flowers. So here I go again, only this time, 
I'm looking at my thumb and I can glance down at my sketch pad. Usually when I think I need to change a direction is kind of how it works. And again, I won't be talking because that will disrupt what I'm trying to do. So here I go starting. There we go. This one is a little bit more recognizable and I didn't run off the paper. But these are real lines that go through your brain from your perception. These kinds of drawing lines have much more life and much more expression than somebody trying to labor away to get every line absolutely perfect with that old eraser and, and drawing harder and harder trying to get it right. It's really fun to do. Um, and after we use it today to build this painting, I hope you'll try it again. It's a wonderful way to draw whatever you're trying to do. So that was modified contour drawing. You notice on the first one I ran right off the paper. Not to worry. We're concerned about the quality of the lines that we're making. So to adapt that, here's my paper ready to do a preliminary drawing for our painting. I've got some flowers piled up here and we're going to use them randomly and I'll show you what I mean. It's not like we have a whole bouquet and we're trying to duplicate that exactly. We're using this idea of this free way of drawing to design our own way we want to use the flowers. So I kind of like this big long iris kind of, of blossom. So I'm going to start by putting that Mm, kind of at an angle across my paper, just because I think that might be interesting. I'm going to do the very same thing. I'm tracking the outline of what I see with my eyes, following it with my pencil, glancing down only 20% of the time. Okay, are you ready? Here we go. I'm starting way down here in the stem. I go slowly. I have to backtrack a little bit. And if I do that, I just drag my pencil along. It just makes more interesting lines. Don't get in too much of a hurry. Because these don't need to be like an illustration out of a horticultural magazine, flowers can be very free form. That's why it's perfect for something like this. Now I need to start somewhere else back down here, so I will move down. Um, also, Every line that you make has to be a double line. If you think about it, even a hair has two sides. And if you do that, you'll be creating places to paint or not paint, which will make more sense as I go along. I'm going to come up with this great big iris leaf. Now I want to add a couple more blossoms, so I'll go back up here. And there's a really pretty little bud up here I see, kind of emerging from the back of the first flower. Okay, there's our first flower. 
we're not done yet. I'll just put this over here. Now I kind of like these daisy, little yellow daisy forms. Um, and I'm not going to use all of them. But this is a good one to start with. It's much more simple. Again, I'm tracking with my eyes the edges. So I think I want that to be somewhere over here. Now, I forgot to tell you, well, no, on purpose I didn't tell you. Now that you've started a little bit, um, you can see you're going to be selecting flowers and arranging them on the paper, really. The only rule I'm going to tell you is that your drawing, when it's complete, has to touch three sides of the paper. So you can't end up with a tiny little drawing in the middle. So let's see. I'm going to put these yellow daisies kind of right over here on the right side. Um, I think I'll start with some of these leaves down here. Those are kind of interesting. And this gives me a chance to head right off the edge of the paper, which breaks up the space in a really interesting way. And I'm going to run out. That's quite okay. I'll come back down here. These leaves are really jaggedy. And then there's a little stem thing, veins that go down the middle. Remember I said you have to have a double line wherever you make one. Not on the outlines of leaves, but on the stems, these kinds of places. Okay, now I'm going to add another leaf. I want it to lean over this way a bit. Oh, I got so interested in the leaves. They're getting kind of big. That's okay. I better add some of those veins in the leaf again. These obviously are artificial flowers. It's great fun once things start to bloom, really, to gather some real flowers to put into your drawing, into your idea. Now we'll add some of the flowers. So I'm coming up here, and I'm going to start to draw what I see of the stem and the blossom. These petals don't have to go off the edge because we did that down there with those big leaves. See how I'm just tracking with my pencil? That's kind of meditative in a way. Now I'll I think I'm going to skip the other flower and just go up to this little blossom bud, I mean, to give a little bit of variety here. Okay, that looks pretty good. Now, another thing I want to consider before I pick my next blossoms is not how the flowers look, but how the spaces look around the flowers. That's called negative space. And that should be as interesting as the actual drawings that you're doing. If you think of it, it's half of your painting. So let's see what we might want to draw from my stash over here. Oh, that's pretty. Maybe we can come right over in here with these flowers um, and select some of the leaves if we want to. I think I'm going to start with this, looks like clusters of berries of some sort, just because that would be a nice difference from anything else that's over here. I'm going to get this guy out of the way right now, maybe. Oh, maybe I should just start with him.
when you're making modified contour drawings, you'll be surprised at the shapes that you get. Because most of us think of a flower as looking at it dead on, round, with something in the center. But that's not how these shapes are at all. And we're making something far more interesting than our perceived idea. I'm drawing over my other flower stem, but that's okay. I can clean that up later. Okay, whoops, I better double my stem down here. I'm going to start with these little clumpy seed pods or whatever they may be. I'm not drawing every single one. I'm getting the idea. That's probably enough of those. Now we've got room for one little sideways flower down here. You don't have to have something everywhere, um, but it looks like it needs something small right here. So I'm going to use this little flower that's sideways to me. I'm just dragging my pencil where I need to go. There. I think that's probably fine. We're a little bit cluttered up over here, so I think if I can remember where I put my eraser. Oh, well. Oh, here we go. Clean this up a little bit. That was overlapping. That's okay. There, I think we're good to go. There, that was fun. It's very relaxing to do actually. Okay, now I'm gonna come out with my handy dandy Sharpie and I'm just gonna go over the lines that I have here. Um, when you're doing this, you wanna be really sure that you keep the quality of the lines that you have because that's what makes these charming to look at and the drawing is a, an important part of this particular painting. Don't start to get real tight and rigid. Just follow what you've got. So this doesn't take very long. I'm also going to move kind of in the direction that I did originally. See how it's all bumpy down here? I want to be sure I keep that. See it kind of come alive. What we don't want to have happen is that your lines become too slick. And is it the end of the world if some pencil lines show? No, it just makes everything more interesting, actually. A 
when I do have to go down to start again, I do pick up my Sharpie in that case, unlike the pencil I told you to do. Doing this veins again, there, we've got double lines. Now let's get up to this little daisy creature. See how this way of drawing gives you much more of a, a real impression of a flower, though we've taken great liberties in what we're doing with them. It has a whole lot more personality than if you labored over every petal trying to get it exactly the way you saw it. These are the way you saw it, just more loosely interpreted. Oh, I saw something we have to correct. I said you had to go off three sides. Well, I've got one, two, and I didn't do anything over here. So we'll have to just bring those little berry things, seed pods out. I can slide right up that kind of iris. Now we're into these little iris petals. Because these are smoother, I can go a little bit faster. I don't have to do all those little indentations. Okay, now we're down to our last flower, almost. I better come back down here or I get too lost and start at the bottom of this stem. This is really fun to do because it doesn't take any brain power at all. You're just following your original design. Okay, now we'll start those.
Now when I get to the top of this cluster here, I'm just going to swing some off. So I follow my own rules. Okay, we've got everything inked in. Now we're ready to start painting. I use a palette that I've had for a long time um, that has all these little wells and you buy the watercolors and tubes, your favorite colors. Um, you can do this project really well with just a, a tray of praying watercolors that you buy for, your, for kids that take to school because the pigments are really strong, really nice. Um, if you already have paints that you can use, it's fine. I usually, like any other thing, the better quality materials you have, the better your results are. So if you're just starting, honestly, get a, get a praying pan. Um, and then you can learn more about paints and palettes and all the things to be really invested in it. The one thing I want you to notice is um, we're going to be talking about warm and cool colors. It's just common sense. I have the warm colors over here at the top of my palette, which is yellow, oranges, and reds. And I have cool colors over here. I have all my blues down into greens. I'm not going to get into the earth tones that I have down here at the bottom. We're just thinking is warm and cool, which gives you lots of choices. So let me put my palette over here. Now the other thing to make watercolor work is water. So I have to get my water bowl. And I need some kind of tissues, paper towels, something to help control the amount of water I'm going to be using. And I'm going to start with a reasonably large, large brush with my clean water. What we're going to do is something called wet in wet painting. I'm not going to make the whole background wet. We're going to make the background in cool colors. That's why when things touch the edges, they create some smaller areas where I can work. Um, so I don't have to worry about water drying out or getting out of control. So to start with, I'm going to work just right up here in this kind of this quadrant and I'm wetting the paper. Now, I don't want the water to go into any of my blossoms or leaves. Paint follows water. And one of the most frustrating things is to be putting down some colors and they're running all over the place. And it's pretty hard to get it under control. This is a good way to begin to learn how to control the watercolor. I'm just going to do right up in this area. Notice I'm not running my brush over the flower blossoms at all. Okay, now let's pick a nice cool color. Oh, I've got some pretty blues. We'll start with this color called cobalt. I just sort of slide it around over here. I'm picking up a little water each time. Watercolor gets lighter as it dries. And I don't want you to worry too much about how dark or light it is. We're just getting some color in here. Okay, now let's add some more water down the next part. I'm using a brush called a flat that's um, got an edge to it, which is easier for me to control anyway around these little ins and outs where I have to go. I'm going to come down on the other side of these leaf forms as well. Right in there. Okay, I'm going to add another blue to the one I started with. This one is ultramarine, which is a really popular. It's a little darker and a little warmer than the one I started with. So I'm going to slide down in here. Maybe I'll blop up there a little bit so it's not isolated. Now you notice how I'm sliding my brush? 
<laughs> the one thing I usually have to tell my students, it gets to be kind of a joke in a class, is stop going pat, pat, pat with your brush, trying to make everything perfect like you're painting a wall. That isn't the way that watercolor works very well. Instead, it works much better if you just slide. Now I'm going to add water down here. Still got a little blue on my brush. That's okay. I'm going to pick up a little bit of Prussian blue. I don't want to do a whole bunch or it's going to look like a patchwork quilt. And because I use the Prussian down here, I'm going to bring some of it up here. And I'll kind of touch it into the cobalt I used. Okay, now I'm going to come over on this side. Maybe I'll go down the middle. When the paper looks shiny, you know you have enough water. And once it begins to dull, you don't want to add anything back to it because you'll have problems. I'm going to add some water right here because I don't want it all the same darkness and lightness. And maybe I'll take my tissues and lift out a little bit. See how that makes a really pretty texture? Okay, let's come over here on this side. Oh, I really like how the different colors are melding together. Okay, I just did this little bunch up here. We'll start with the cobalt again. Where's my cobalt? There we go. I picked up a little more water because I don't want it quite as dark. Now I'll pick up some ultramarine. And if I think it looks too strong, I just add a little water. Keep sliding around. Now we just have to do the bottom quadrant. And maybe in these little spaces, maybe not. That's going to be up to you. And I think I'll finish down here with some more cobalt. Now let's pick, just do a little bit of a touch of a tissue. Okay, we've got our background done. So just to reiterate, here's what I would have you remember. Um, just to work in a small area at a time. Um, to slide your brush when you're putting the colors on. Just keep it really loose and free. And that the paint will follow the water. So you don't want anything wet where you don't want color to be. Then the last thing we did was just blot it a little bit to make some texture. Though some of it is all moved around anyway. But it makes it more interesting to look at than you if you were trying to make everything perfectly even. Okay, now I need to clean my palette a little bit because we're going to switch to warm colors. And that will give us a little bit of time for the paint to dry. Okay, now remember I said the warm colors were yellow, orange, reds. Just think of sun, warm sunshine, which is a nice thing to think about today. Um, those are the warm colors, cool like the ocean, like water. So it's green, blues, lavenders, anything in that family. Okay, now I'm going to show you how we're going to drop in color. Um, for this, I'm going to use 
a round brush. This one's called a flat because it has that nice edge on it. This is a round, it's got a point. So it, that's how we're going to use it, use, take advantage of that point. Um, let's see now. Let's start up here. I'm just going to drop water in part of it. Then I'm going to pull out one of my yellows. It makes it pretty thick with quite a bit of water. And I'm going to drop it in. See what happens? It just sort of goes, pachoo, and there it is. It's fun. Okay, now I'm going to drop water into this little petal. Oh, it's got color already, so I don't think I have to do any more to that one. Okay. Now, as I recall, some of these flowers were deeper color, so maybe we'll go into some reds, just for the fun of it. So I add pretty thick water and this color I'm pulling out is called Scarlet Lake. Paint colors have these cool names, I think, anyway. I'm kind of shoving this where I'd like it to go. Get some more water. No, I guess I don't. The reason I'm leaving all this white is because white is what makes watercolor come alive. If I covered that all up, the painting sort of dulls down. I guess the phrase is it loses its sparkle. And the more the paint, you paint, the more you learn to control that. This is just an easy way to start because we on purpose left walls of dry paper so the paint can't go flooding all over the place. I'm just adding a little bit more of red. Again, this is a Scarlet Lake. I once worked under a painting teacher from Phoenix, Arizona. And she did, because of all the bright, brilliant colors in Arizona, um, she had, I think, maybe 10 different reds on her palette. You could believe me, her paintings were vibrant. Let's try something for the heck of it. I'm going to add a little bit of orange on the edges. Whoa, that's pretty. Half the fun is experimenting. If you don't like it, you know you can not do that next time. I like the extra orange. Okay. Now I'm going to make this color, this plant, excuse me, flower down here, a shade of yellow or orange, I think. Maybe I'll mix the two. So I'm using the orange and a yellow called New Gamboge. I think this was my flower. My brush already has color on it, so I can just drop this in. Mm, let's see, I've got two flowers left, so maybe I'll do this one yellow and that one orange, since I've got orange going here.
That's pretty nice. And let's do a yellow one down here. Since these little petals are smaller, I'm wetting them all at the same time. There, I'll just concentrate the color down at the base of the flower. Well, that's pretty. Now, what are we going to do with those leaves? You surely don't have to make green leaves because that's what we think of as leaves. Um, that first painting I showed you, I actually used brown tones on the leaves to make them different. Um, I think we'll use a really warm yellow green. I'll mix that on my palette because it was we're working with warm colors but you'll see in a minute wait here's my leaf this green is a very warm green I'm going to drop the color in And then we've got all these, these uh, I don't know what those things are, pods, I guess. So I'll just add, a, I'll do, uh, experiment a minute on this first part, see what we get. There, I think that works. If I put the paint kind of down at the base of each little ball, it suggests the shape, yeah, that's, and leave some white. That looks pretty good. Okay, now, I think I've got one flower up here. I was thinking it was a leaf. It's not, so I think we'll do that yellow. Not very much. We'll just drop in some color to leave lots of white. There, that's happy. And I have one great big iris leaf and some stems. So we better come up with a new color for them. Let's see. I think I'll warm up the green a little bit more. There we go. And add the I think I'll make him a little bit more solid. Finish off these. And I see one little petal over here. There. Well, that's pretty happy. Now we'll do one last thing, just because it's so much fun. Um, I'm going to bring some ultramarine blue out here on my palette. Whoops, nope, that's indigo, which is a really dark blue. And I have to make it really watery.
Let me practice this on another piece of paper so you can see what I'm going to do. Does this show up down here? Maybe I'll try it over here. I've got my brush all loaded with darker blue paint and I'm going to hit it against my hand. I won't do it right this minute. I want to do it on the practice paper. Yep, that's pretty good. See how it adds extra texture and a little bit of sparkle to your painting? And I'm going to zip that up there because I don't like that so much. And add a little bit of... Okay, there we did it. I hope you enjoyed your venture into flower painting. Just remember we started with modified contour drawing. Then we did Sharpie over the top of it. We used cool colors in the background and we used warm colors to make the flowers. I hope you enjoyed the journey. I certainly enjoyed sharing with you. Thanks.